Okay, so lots of ground to cover today. Uh, thanks for joining me live, those of you that are here and those of you that are watching later. I know this will be a webinar that will be watched quite heavily later on, given the other three mock exams that we've done in the past. This mock exam was recorded a few months ago, back in the spring, and I've been kind of saving it for the fall, because I know a lot of you will want to see something a little bit different. And then I'm going to go through a rather lengthy introduction here, just as an update, because um, I know some of you checking in are going to want to see the, or hear about my update when you're watching later on YouTube. I'm going to talk about our new database for a little bit and the teacher and student portals and what's going on with those. I'll talk a little bit about exams for February, because a lot of you are asking questions about that. I'll talk about the protocol around mock exams and how this is going to work through the webinar and where you can find all the information after the fact for those that are trying to watch later and how this is going to work. And then I'll talk about the webinar schedule before we actually start. So first of all, our new database, which is the which are the teacher and student portals that a lot of you have already had access to and trying to log in. In our experience so far, we're finding that about half of you are actually having trouble with that process. And so our tech team in London, Ontario called Invorg, they're very good at setting you up very easily. If any of you have trouble setting up your account in the new portal, it's very important that you do set it up with the credentials that we give you in an email. And a lot of you probably didn't get those emails if you haven't tried already, which is fine. We expected that process. Just send us an email, send to officeadmin at conservatorycanada.ca or Deborah at conservatorycanada.ca. She'll forward you on to Invorg and they'll set you up within an email. They'll tell you exactly what to do to get in there so that you can connect your old teacher account to your new teacher account so that all the academic records are there from your students and all that kind of stuff. Very important. If you go in and try and just simply create a new account, you're not going to be linked to your old data. And in fact, we may lose all of the old data, which we do not want. So as you have students that or as you have a need, I guess, to log into the portal and see information, see past results, see if your students are getting registered, you're going to want to log into that new process. And the links on our website in the top right corner of the homepage will take you there. Teacher portal will take you right to the login options. Take option three for now. And if it's not working, let us know and we'll get you hooked up on that right away. Anyone, if any students want to register for an exam now, they have to do it through their new portal. They have to go through the same process. And again, if they're having trouble, reach out to us and we can get you hooked up and into the new portal so that students can get registered for exams. Uh, a lot of people have been asking what's happening for exams in February. Uh, of course, since the pandemic, 100% of our exams have been done online on a flex basis. We're hearing from a lot of you that this is the way you want to go for the future. And you know, we appreciate that. Um, we've been doing it since 2007 that way. And before the pandemic, one quarter of all our exams were held on a flex basis. We anticipate now that about two thirds of all our exams will be held on a flex basis now that people are used to it and they understand the convenience and, and how, how well it can work. For the other third of those that want in-person exams, we're going to try for February. Um, and we've got examiners set up all around the country in different locales. It's just that the number is going to be a lot lower because we have fewer people that are interested in those. So it's going to be harder for us to fly an examiner from the outside to that locale, get them organized, accommodation expenses are you know, skyrocketing through the roof. And so we're going to have to go about it a different way. Luckily, we've been planning for this for quite a while a number of years by getting regional examiners set up in as many centers as possible. So any of the large centers that have a full day of exams, we can try and get a, a live examiner there in February. Uh, no guarantees at this point, but many centers we're going to be able to make that a possibility. If there are only two or three students there, it's going to be a little bit tougher, but we can talk about the options around providing a live examiner if we have a regional examiner available in your center. So email me if you want more information about that, Derek at conservatorycanada.ca, and I'll be able to help you out with that. But we are looking and, and working toward in-person exams for February in a limited number of centers, hopefully in more centers for June 2023. Um, the February session is actually not open in the new portal yet. It's been all we can do over the last four weeks since we launched those new portals to get everyone registered and into it. Now that people are starting to think about registering, we're going to extend the registration deadline from mid-November to late November, and we're going to actually open that session next week in the new portal so that students can register for a February exam should you feel that it, it could be helpful to have an in-person exam or you want to work toward that. So you're the first to hear about that. We're apologizing right now that there's a bit of a delay in having that registration process up and running. It's usually up in mid-September on the old portals, but with the migration to the new portal, we've had a bit of a delay there. Uh, but in case that's one of your questions, just know that that's the possibility and that's what we're working toward. 
And then in terms of webinar schedule coming up next Friday, today's the 14th. On the 21st, next Friday, we're going to have Rebecca Featherstone here, Musicology app, which is an app that I use for all of my online teaching, which isn't a lot. But I'm trying to get to also exams done. You'll see the exam today was done on the Musicology app. And I just love it because you can have a back and forth conversation with the student. You can overlap while you're talking. I can interrupt the student while they are playing and they will hear me and be able to adjust. And I can hear dynamic range. You'll hear that all through the Musicology app today through YouTube, but I recorded it on the Musicology app. And we're going to have Rebecca here next Friday to talk all about the Musicology app, what's new for it, how it can help and enhance your online teaching. Um, I just think it works a little bit better than Zoom, I find. In some cases, maybe a lot better than Zoom. Zoom is all the time seems to be suppressing background noise more and more, which makes it difficult in some ways for us to hear a lesson that's going on. Um, and then the week after that, the 28th, of May. I'm really working hard on my brain. For the first time, we're going to have Dr. Elaine Keeler here, who is a professor emeritus from University of Carleton or Carleton University. And she's going to be sharing some of her research. And this is a really interesting one. Those of you that have seen the emails know she's going to talk about composer Muzio Clementi, uh, about his life, about who he was, about who he was as a publisher, a piano maker, not only just a composer. And she has a copy, or I don't even, I don't, it may be one of the real things, I'm not sure, she's going to let us know. She has a Clemente Forte piano in her home studio, and she's going to perform um, one of the sonatas for us on the Clemente piano and talk about its relevance to the Forte piano. So that's going to be a great one. You're not going to want to miss that. And then the week after, which is November 4th, I believe, all webinars are Friday at noon. We're going to have Eleanor Gummer and Cecile de Rosier back again. They were with us last week. They're going to come, come back and talk more about uh, women composers. And then on November 11th, we have Elaine coming back again, Elaine Keeler, who's going to talk about ornamentation. Uh, Elaine has her PhD. She's done a lot of research on performance practice, specifically keyboard ornamentation. And she's going to cover, I think, a good 250 years of trills and different ornaments and how we ought to do them and what the research says about those ornaments and how they'd be executed in different places at different times. Another one not to miss. And then on the 18th of November, Friday, we're going to have for the first time Dr. Gilles Como, University of Ottawa. He has a piano pedagogy research lab there, and he's going to come to us for the first time to talk about the research, why studio teachers such as ourselves should be interested in research of this type, what kind of research is coming out, and he's really going to seed a lot of neat ideas. I think for us, it's going to be the first of hopefully many conversations we can have with him in the, in the forthcoming future. So that's the basic schedule that we've got for webinars coming up over the next month. I think you'll find them uh, very interesting and I appreciate that we have a live audience here with a bunch of you today and that all of you that were able to watch on YouTube here with us. If anyone in the live audience has questions at any time on Zoom, feel free to put them in the chat box or put them in the Q&A. And so that's just a little update about things from CC for those of you watching later and those watching live. I know some of you have questions about that stuff. Feel free to ask any time. And then to talk about mock exams and how they work, this is a little bit convoluted, but I think I've developed a process a few months ago that's working. And so I'm going to share my screen and give you a little idea about how this is all put together. And those of you watching this webinar after the fact, this will be really helpful to know how I'm working this. In the description for the webinar replay, which is going to upload to YouTube later today automatically, there's going to be a link to this document which will give you a link to a marking grid. And the marking grid is a really cool little thing that was invented many years ago that allow us to mark the pieces in different ways. I'm going to throw that in the chat box now for everybody live so you can download the marking grid if you need it. There you go. A marking form. And the marking form is going to allow you to mark along with me and you'll be able to see how much everything is worth and gives you a chance at getting everything right, which is really important when we're marking and assessing. And then the link to the actual mock exam on YouTube will be in this little readme file. And I'm putting that in the chat box now. This is YouTube link for the mock exam, which we'll get to shortly. So what we're gonna do, the process is, I'm gonna go through a little slideshow here briefly. We're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we assess just some general things. Then we're all going to break. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to stop the live stream. We're all going to watch the exam through YouTube using the link I just put in the chat box. Those of you watching this later, you will see this in a different place. Here is our YouTube channel here. 
and you can go, you can see actually the mock exam. I just made it public a, a few minutes ago. It's the first one here at the home page, but the best way to find all of this stuff is on playlists here in the top middle. I click on the playlists menu and up come mock exams over here. I click on mock exams okay, Samantha. and I search for mock exam grade three classical piano from October 14th. That's today when I were recording this. You click on that and that will take you to the actual mock exam that I recorded through the Musicology app. We're all going to watch that together, but not through the live stream here. I'm going to pause everything. And then once we're done watching that, we're going to come back to the webinar. And so those of you watching later, you're going to go back to the channel. Okay, Samantha. Back to well, the playlist. Let's end that other one. That shouldn't be there. And you'll find us back on mock exam webinar replays. And in uh, mock uh, exam webinar replays, you will see the replay there for October 14th. And that's where I'll go over in about 25 minutes from now, the rationale behind what the marks were and the comments. And we can have a nice lively discussion about how we arrive at those marks. So that's the process of how this goes. There are those of you watching later, you're gonna find this in two places. You're already on the webinar. So just stay there, but go back to the webinar and look at the, or look, go back to the YouTube channel watch the mock exam and then come back to here where you are now and the, and the recording will just pick up where we left off so that's a little bit about how that's going to work a little bit complicated but it does work and i know you'll be able to keep up and so i'm just going to present my slideshow and we'll talk a little bit about some of the semantics here and how we make things work so the marking grid allows us to quickly provide accurate results because every element can get divided into a percentage uh, some of you last year were asking how this works if the piece is out of, let's say 12, I go to the number 12 across the top row and I scroll down with my finger to figure out what percentage I want for that piece. Let's say the student wanted, I want them to 82% 80, on that piece. I would give them 9.8 out of 12. And I do that for each and every element on the exam. So again, in the chat box, there's a link to the marking grid. Those of you can, that are watching later, you can go to the webinar that you're watching currently. And in the description, you will find a link to the marking grid, or you'll find a link to that other document I gave that gives you a link to the marking grid and the marking form, which looks like this. Uh, and that's where you can keep track of your comments if you like in your marks, and we can compare later and see how close you were to what we've decided this, these performances would receive. Here's the basic mark distribution for grade, or grade three classical piano. Each of the pieces is worth 10, which is really handy. Uh, the student gets eight marks for memorizing the four group pieces. Group one is Baroque and classical repertoire. Students have to have two pieces of that nature, and two pieces can be from group two, which is romantic and modern. The own choice piece is a free piece. They don't even need free approval for that as long as you think it's at the level that grade three merits, then you can use it. You don't need free approval or approval for any of the own choice pieces, just any of the group pieces that aren't on our syllabus lists already. Technique is worth 16. Sight reading and ear training, you'll see exactly how those take place. And I should note, there's also a great, another grade three classical exam you can compare to in the webinar replays. You'll see one there. You'll also see a contemporary idioms level five exam, which is really cool for those that are interested in how contemporary idioms piano works. And then the other one, I can't recall now what it is, but you'll see, I think it's a grade four classical piano. Uh, background information, you'll see how that works today in quite a bit of detail. That's worth six marks. A bonus mark for including a work by a Canadian composer and the whole thing is out of 100. That's what we're assessing and that's that's the basic idea here. Uh, there's this thing called the critical listening protocol that we developed years ago that informs our ears as examiners. I'll just talk briefly about it. So in my mind, I'm always listening in layers right away. It's, what's the rhythm? Are the correct notes there? What's the rhythm though? How's the pulse working? Is the tempo the same? Does the student have fluency already? And if they do, if the rhythm's in check and the notes are mostly accurate, right away our, 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 we bounce to eight out of 10 or 80% on a piece of music. A student can't get 80% on a piece unless their rhythm is in check and it's steady and there's no hesitations, things like that. The odd slip or a couple of hesitations is not a big deal, but we're listening for overall, what's the student's level of preparedness with this piece of music? Then our ear moves to articulation. If the rhythm layer and the notes aren't in place yet, it's not fluent, there's numerous hesitations, it's almost as if the student is reading or sight reading. The examiner or the listener's ear does not move on to articulation, phrasing, inflection, dynamics. We don't hear that. 
we stop, we comment about the rhythm, we make sure the student gets the understanding in the family that this is the first layer that needs to be in place first, and then we build a foundation of musical elements on top of that. If that's not in place, generally the assessment's not worth 80% and the student has some work to do. Assuming that rhythm and notes are in check, then the ear moves to articulation. How are the notes being spoken? Are there legato slurs? Are there staccatos? Are there lifts? Are there things that are stylistically appropriate to how the notes should be spoken and connected or disconnected? For lack, you know, it's more of a scientific way of looking at it, I suppose. If that's in place, then the ear moves to phrasing, inflection, and dynamics. Is there some kind of expression going on? Does the phrasing make sense within the style and the genre or what the composer has indicated on the score? And then if we hear that in place, then the students probably in the high 80s in terms of their assessment to get into the 90s, they should have a sense of style and performance practice in place. Is the music suiting the dialect of the genre or time period that it comes from? Does it sound like Baroque music? Is it being articulated like Baroque music? Are there suitable inflections to the phrases? Um, are there other performance practice suggestions that often go into that? Are they all taken into account? And that's what a lot of the Friday webinars are addressing is style and performance practice. And, and some of the ones coming up too, I think you'll like. That'll inform that sort of part of the mark, getting the student into the 90s. And then structure, depth of communication is just sort of a final check. You know, if everything is really well in place, we're assessing too. Is a student sound and aware of the structure of the piece of music? There's a section A, then it moves to section B, maybe with a different mood. And then section A returns. Are they sensitive to the transitions between those? And I'll talk a little bit about that in some of the music today that we hear when we do the commentary after we all listen to the mock exam. The examiner's ear progresses to the next level of listening only once the previous layer is heard. Otherwise it stops, that's where the comment stops, that's where the assessment kind of stops in the ear. So that we build something coherent, we build a rubric for something that's actually, you know, rather subjective, this is a way of us objectifying it and starting to build language around how we can assess and how we can listen critically. And then it's up to us to find a way to lovingly entrap our students into a way to understand this without boring them, without, uh, you know, without making it too dry, we still want to make it fun. But these are sort of the layers that we follow in our teaching. We don't want to start talking about dynamics if rhythm isn't addressed first then there's going to be something missing. And so this is why I'm sharing this with you, how the examiners think so that we can all refine our teaching in the same way. There's something at the bottom of the protocol that I call core sound or tone quality. On the piano, we don't assess that often enough, especially at the younger, at the younger levels. But you'll notice students that are, are conveying or communicating with a depth of communication have a certain weight to the sound that communicates through the room through the instrument, it's not timid, it's not just a local sound for themselves, but it's something that resonates and broadcasts well. And we, I often refer to, you know, singers or string players, or woodwind players, we assess this right away. What's the sound quality of the instrument? Are they fully resonating? On the piano, it's too easy almost to create, a, to, to create sound, but we're still assessing for that core sound and something that informs our ear through the critical listening protocol right from start to finish. And sometimes if we're not sure about how it sounds, sometimes we just zoom out and the first thing we want to listen for is what's the sound, what's the tone quality. And then we can look at it through the technique scales towards arpeggios. How is the mechanism working in the arm? And you'll see today it's working quite well. So I can talk about that a little bit more, quite a bit more. If anyone has any questions about this, this thing, we're trying to take the esoteric idea of just assigning a mark based on how we feel. And we're trying to quantify it in a language that makes sense so that examiners, we can standardize our marks over time. Okay, so on to the mock exam. I'm going to stop share here for a moment. You, oh, those of you that have joined me live, you can see the YouTube link there. I'm just going to paste it one more time in case anyone joined late and doesn't see that in the chat. That is where you go and watch the mock exam now. We're all going to watch that separately. Uh, those of you that are watching this after the fact, I'm stopping the recording. Go over to the other playlist that's for mock exams. Look this up. Listen to the exam. Make your assessment. And then we're all going to come back here in about 20 minutes and I'll continue the stream and you'll see the continuation for what that is. Now, someone's saying the links don't seem to be coming up for you. Let me check. I think I, yeah, okay. So I've changed the settings today so that attendees and panelists can chat with everybody. Oh, you know what? I understand what I did there. I have to change the setting here. I'm so sorry. First of all, I'm glad you guys said that. I'm, not, I'm going to go back and paste those links in again. I see what happened there. 
I'm going to send all the links again here. So I'm going to go back to my README file. And you'll see this, those of you. It's just going to take me a second. In the description. Okay, so first of all, we've got the marking grid. I'm putting that into the chat box first. I didn't have everyone selected when I, when I selected these earlier, or I tried to send these to you all earlier. So that's the marking grid. The marking form is coming now. So take a second to download those, print them off if you need. And then YouTube link. The YouTube link to the mock exam I've labeled there. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming everyone can see that now. Please let me know if you can't. Take your time to go through that. Go over to the mock exam now, and I'll meet you back here in about 20 minutes or so. You're still going to see me on the screen, those of you that are here live. Uh, just know that you should be on the mock exam now through the YouTube link. Anyone has any questions or something's not working right, please hit me in the chat box. And I'll be watching. So we'll talk again shortly. And we're back live on YouTube as well. Thanks all of you for watching that and, and participating. I know most of you are done now. And we're going to talk about the rationale behind the marks. And I'll share my screen with some detailed notes and marks so you can compare. And then those of you live, feel free to ask questions. Those of you that are watching this after the fact, um, if you haven't already, go back and watch the mock exam under the playlist mock exams. Look for October 14th, grade three classical piano, and watch that. Then come back to this point in this webinar and you can view the rationale if you want. Okay, so sharing my screen. And if anyone has a question at any point in time, let me know. And I'll monitor the chat box as well. So we've gone through the critical listening protocol and what that means for us listening to each of these pieces. The first piece that the student played, and first of all, I just note, you know, every time I listen to this back through the Musicology app, I don't know if you could hear, not a lot of inflection and dynamic variety today, but when it was there, I felt like I could hear a lot more, even just through their, through the, the built-in microphone on the laptop they were using. They weren't using an external microphone like I was. And before I forget to mention, there were times where my external mic at the time was sitting on the desk right by my computer or right on, it was actually sitting on my keyboard. That's where it was. So when I was playing the ear training, you were hearing this hammering noise going through the microphone I wasn't aware of. So I learned a lot by doing that. Never place my external mic on the piano because it makes an awful racket. And the student did a, did a good job, I think, filtering through that noise. So the first piece the student played, we always give them the choice of what they want to do first. Would you like to do your pieces first, do your technique first? If they're a bit shy, we'll give them those two options. He, want, he was prepared to play a group two piece Blue Boogie. And so this is what I came up with here for Blue Boogie. We hear a pulse that is steady. It's a very safe tempo and it keeps us feeling a strong quarter note pulse, which is okay, it's, it's steady. But the fluency isn't quite there yet in terms of you know racing forward and creating long ideas. The articulation is reliably detached where needed because a lot of this music is written in staccato. The staccato could be shorter to help achieve more speed. That's just something that's in process with this particular student at this point in time. So the fluency is developing, just needs a bit more shape, crescendo, diminuendo to create interest in longer phrases. The dynamics were effective at the end of the middle section. We could hear when he was climbing. There was a dynamic variety there in one place, which was already planned out and coming out. So that was appreciated. So I commented on that. Overall, it's a secure performance, just needs more expression next, especially from the softer dynamic. And as the tempo works up a bit, normally we would typically hear this piece a little bit faster. Taking that and balancing all those factors, you know, there is steadiness there already. There's rhythmic awareness. There's some expression developing. So we're into the 80s. And so I gave this one a mark of 8.4 out of 10. Not quite at that mid 80s mark yet, 8.5, 8.6, which, which would give us sort of a gold standard on the digital badges. For those of you that have heard me talk about digital badges, gold is 8.6 or higher on a piece of music. So this is getting close to that. We just need to hear a little bit more to really be convincing. So that's the group two piece, one of the two group two pieces. The second piece he wanted to play was a group one, the classical sonatina by Fritz Spindler from the grade three book. Pulse is somewhat steady, again, with a safe, or a safe tempo, 
until the development section in the middle. And then it was somewhat unsteady, a little bit hesitant, fighting the memory. I mean, it was amazing that he memorized all these pieces already. It just created a few unsteady moments in the middle. Uh, he was able to battle well through the middle and regain fluency toward the end. And the eights are uneven in a few places. This just needs a little bit more time, I think, to be convincing for memory. Uh, when we listen, it's, it's a bit fixated on the quarter note pulse, needs a bit more speed for better fluency and to convey more length to the ideas. And this piece really should have two beats per bar as, as a type of feeling to it. And, you know, I should mention too, this student did very well, scored in the low 90s when they actually did the exam a few weeks later. Um, so you're very much in process, but it gives us a lot to think about in this particular assessment, because where he plays today is right up the middle in terms of what we typically hear on exam. We hear things better, we hear things not, not as well, but he's right in the middle at this particular point in time. So it's pretty steady. We have to make mention of the pulse and the fact that there's some hesitations there. In the meantime, we are he hearing some good articulation. There's a good sense of legato where needed developing. There are some dynamics observed, but could use more obvious contrasts. At this point, he's, he's still focusing more on the pulse. So given that pulse was still an issue, especially in the middle, it wasn't quite holding together. It's maybe not quite 80% on this piece. So I gave it a mark of 7.6. Typically we'd hear it a little quicker and probably not far off getting 8.0 out of 10 on this piece. And some people may even be tempted to go there, but not quite because of the middle section. If we're thinking about digital badges, again, I keep coming back, this would be a solid silver. Um, bronze would have to be a lot, a lot less in place. The next was a group two piece called Dumka. I hadn't heard of this piece and he didn't know who the composer was. I'll show you the background information breakdown later, what he missed and what he got. Um, but Dumka, um, I realized later was John Paul George. I can't remember exactly what book it comes from. And this piece is very steady, suitable tempo, just a couple of small hesitations. The rhythm is mostly in place. We start listening to tone quality and balance between the hands. It's a bit too even. We're hearing a lot of left hand, we're hearing the right hand, but they're kind of competing a bit too much. So I think the left hand could be quieter in order to hear more of the melody. And then it's also hard to hear any dynamic variation at this point in time with this performance. I can hear some shaping, crescendo, diminuendo, and the phrase is coming. We just need to hear more of it and get the left hand out of the way, I think, to be more convincing artistically or expressively. The pulse features each beat with equal weight, which is a bit problematic. We need to save the accent for the phrase highlight maybe once every two bars. Right now, it's just a little heavy again on the quarter note, which is a theme in this exam. That's where he is with the fluency. It inhibits us from hearing expression. It inhibits us from understanding structure and phrase length and inflection and that kind of thing. So it's in process. I'd say barely in the 80s, and I gave this 8.3 because of the good work that's already there. Um, but still not enough to get us into the mid 80s or get us into that gold standing category. Fourth piece went back to Baroque, Bure and G minor, Telemann. It's a bit sluggish overall, right? Slower tempo than we would normally hear, but the rhythm is understood. He understands the difference between eighth notes and quarter notes. It's just that even though the pulse is almost steady, it's just a little bit too slow for what we would normally want to hear here. Notes are mostly correct. Just needs more time to develop the fluency, but interesting that the articulation is already suitable and well thought out. He's coached very well in terms of how Baroque music goes. Separate bows denote detached quarter notes in there, even in the right hand in this piece. And that's, I thought that was well thought out already. Each beat just feeling a bit heavy, needs a bit more time to work up that tempo. And so we kept this mark in the 70s still, 7.6 out of 10 for this particular piece, but very close, I would think, to scoring in the 80s. And then once he is in the 80s, probably already in the mid 80s because the articulation is, is already understood. We don't really honor the articulation so much yet in the mark, we wanna see the rhythm in place. And that's why the mark is less than eight out of 10. Again, if anyone has any questions, fire away in the chat box or the Q&A and I'll follow and stop as we go along. Own choice piece, students can pick whatever they want. This is a great example of an own choice piece uh, from the Tetris theme video game. Video game music is incredibly popular among, among students, both male and female at this point on exams. Some good fluency in the pulse. There's an internet issue at one point. We'll talk about that in a second. Needs a quieter left hand for better balance between the hands again so that we can hear the right hand melody a little bit better. And the right hand melody could use more shape, more inflection, crescendo, diminuendo to convey more interest. 
suffering a bit from heaviness on each beat like some of the other music today although the fluency in the tempo is kind of hiding this a little bit more than the other pieces it's a little further along than the bourree let's say and so because of that just into the 80s 8.2 just has to work out the heaviness get some expression in there and probably be in the high 80s in no time with this piece once that's addressed for him with a little bit more time in terms of the internet issue you probably all looked you know this this does happen on exams i normally try to be hardwired so i know it's not me um, and through the musicology app, then I know it's usually easy to resurrect once their internet comes back up and stops phasing through their modem, however they're, however they're connected. And so all I do in that situation with Examiner, if I really lose them, I, I refresh the page. They do the same thing at some point, hopefully an adult's there to step in and help them out. And then, um, and then we come back together and that's when I started the recording. And so that process actually did take a couple of minutes. I waited for him. But when we're scheduling flex exams over the internet like this, because that happens, frequently it's not rare maybe more frequent um we schedule more time for that so that we can allow for it we're not skipping anything we're we're not going over anything like that or trying to stay on some kind of crazy timeline that doesn't exist we're we're we're, we're factoring that into the scheduling of our exams and it's just a part of life it seems over the last three years isn't it technique I've listened to this a couple times to try and get the right mark and, and I ended up coming back to my original projection when I'm doing technique, I've got my finger on the marking grid in the 16 column, and I'm going down and I'm hovering around 80% most of the time here, down a little bit, up a bit. Some of the elements are stronger. For me, I dipped below 80% on this until he did the arpeggios, which were a little better, and brought me back up to 81, 82, and that gave me 13.1 out of 16. The scales are mostly steady. Just a few hesitations, a little bit of unevenness in some of the scales, especially the minor ones. The triads, the D major solid left-hand triads, difficult, a little bit hesitant. Otherwise, the triads are okay. And then the arpeggios were good, just a couple small hesitations there, but, but good enough just to, to keep this mark afloat just over 80%. If I look on my grid, I think it's 82 or maybe 81. 13.1 out of 16 is 82%. Any questions about technique at all or anything else? Anyone who wants to challenge the marker, feel free to let me know. Uh, background information. So in summary, he wasn't sure of the composers very well today. So Sonatina, he didn't know the composer, wasn't sure of the Dumka composer. He got the key wrong on the Sonatina. Um, he didn't need to know the Tetris composer. And I caught myself after I actually asked him about that and I shouldn't have. So he doesn't lose a mark for that at all. But he was able to give me another little you know, piece about that, something about Russian. And it kind of sounded that way. I think his background is Russian too. So it kind of has a special meaning for him, maybe. I don't know. Able to answer all of the questions about signs and terms. And you can see I did a demonstration there of how the examiner can do that with the webcam and get really specific answers. When we're in person, we often ask the student to point to something, but in this case, we can still test their knowledge the same way. Basically, he got four things wrong, I believe. So I gave him four out of six. It's usually minus 0.5 for every mistake or thing that you're not quite sure about or forgot on an exam. Most students do get six out of six, and I'm sure he got six out of six after the fact if he's in the low 90s on his final exam with it, when he actually did it uh, weeks later. Sight reading, clapping. Um, you can see here he was a little bit impaired by having to count out loud, so he had to process. And I mentioned this on another exam that we did back in the spring where the student's counting out loud and trying to clap. And so he's a bit at the mercy of how quickly he can process the verbal counting and it slows everything down. And so a mark of two out of three is pretty fair in this case. He seems to understand the ratios. He just can't put it together fluently yet playing same thing. He knows how to hit pitches. He understands rhythmic ratios between notes, but not able to do it fluently with a, with a steady pulse. And that's typically what we hear. What he played on sight reading today is very typical for what we actually hear on exams. I mean, students, it seems, barely have time to practice scales, let alone sight reading these days. Uh, but that's a whole other issue. Some students do pull this together and seem to work on it. Uh, it often depends, I think, on the teacher's method and how much, how many pieces of music a student reads through through a beginner before getting to grade one, how many pieces they learn through grade one before going to grade two, that kind of thing. I know in my studio, I, I try to mention this whenever I can, but um, I go through a lot of music before grade one. It usually takes two to three years uh, through six different beginner books, in fact, over three levels using the Hal Leonard piano method. It's quite quite a task for a lot of students, but then they get to grade one, they can sight read really well. Uh, I used to have them learn about 30 grade one pieces before, before moving on to grade two or before doing an exam. Now it's a lot less. It's maybe only 24 or so or 20 pieces, depending on the student. I spend a lot of time in those younger levels with students 
to build the sight reading so that it doesn't take them so long. By the time they get to grade three, grade four, things can move quite quickly if they need, if they're able. And then by the time they get to grade five, they can read quickly. They can read a piece of music in a week. And it's so much more liberating. It gives us as teachers so much more time to talk about expression and other things when they have that level of skill. And you can see that on students in their sight reading marks on the exam. Do I recommend any books for sight reading? Nothing specific. I mean, the four star books are out there. They've, they've served us for a very long time and I think they're fine. Um, I haven't seen anything really remarkable you know, other than these dry exercises, we have some dry exercises in the E Sharp Club. Honestly, twenty dollar annual membership that you can you can use just to get basic exercises to show students. Um, I haven't found anything you know overly modern or revolutionary in terms of sight reading books. Uh, if anyone else has anything they like to use that they're they're fond of, go ahead and throw it in the chat box. Um, at the conservatory, we did published something sort of, or we had a mock-up of something to publish years ago, but we never did actually publish. I actually have hard copies of that. It, it wasn't a bad little thing, but, um, you know, I would actually recommend Andrew Harbridge's books now that I think of it. Harbr Andrew Harbridge Publishing House. Um, I would check out his stuff because he's got technique and skills books from grades one to six for classical piano, levels one to six, contemporary idioms piano, two different series of books. And they write out all the scales and everything. And he's got now sight reading exercises right in there. And all those are really good too. So I think that's probably our best resource for CC exams at this point. So I would encourage anyone that you know wants that kind of resource to check it out. Uh, otherwise, I think a lot of teachers use the old four-star books and just find examples that fit our syllabus, which probably isn't all that hard. In terms of ear training, that's pretty cut and dried. The clap back was a little bit hesitant, but everything else seemed to be fine. And then I'm getting an exam total of 82.1. Uh, those of you that have added this up, go ahead and share. What did you get in terms of your final mark for this student? Can you throw that in the chat box? Be curious to compare our marks and see where he's at. I think the playing is around 80, maybe 79, but due to the strength of the ear training, kind of got his mark a little higher. And the fact that everything was memorized, you know, if he's got eight out of eight for memory, it's pretty hard to score less than 80 on an exam. Okay, 83, 86. Mm hmm Anybody else? I hope you found this helpful and informative. And of course, feel free to uh, throw questions in the chat box. Karen, 7882, Cheryl. Yeah, I think in the final analysis, when I look at it, I think, okay, well, his technique was at 13. That might seem a bit generous. Sometimes maybe only 12.8 out of 16 that right at the 80% mark might be, but that's not going to affect the overall mark too much. So the examiner, we zoom back at the end and say, is this a fair mark for this student for what they presented today? Um, it seems a little higher than where his playing is, but you can hear the potential, but we don't honor potential in the exam. We just take the snapshot of where we are at that point in time. But based on the strength of eight out of eight for memorizing, background questions wasn't a total disaster. He just lost some easy marks on composer. Um, ear training is strong, you know, that alone buoys those marks up and gets them up over 80%, I think. So any other questions here at this point in time? Of course, if anyone watching after the fact has any serious questions that you really want to answer, feel free to email me, Derek, D-E-R-E-K, at conservatorycanada.ca, and we can talk about what you saw. Maybe you'll present some comments in the YouTube stream later and we can have a look at those and I can try and answer them for you. But I hope everyone found this helpful and I hope you can watch some of the other mock exams if you haven't already. There are three others there from last spring. Um, I think they're really helpful to give you a look at what's inside the exam room. We don't have any more of these planned for the next while. Of course, if anyone wants a student to have a mock exam, we have a few teachers that participated last year and the family seemed really grateful for the chance to you know, two to four weeks before the actual exam, go through this process and get some feedback. I think a lot of them using, the, using it to motivate the student to see where they were. In the most part, they're in that low 80s and, you know, what they can do, they get some helpful feedback. They can get their markup quite a bit in a short space of time. So if any of you have a student that wants to do a mock exam or you think would benefit from it, I'm open to recording these anytime throughout the year and then presenting them as long as the family is okay with me presenting them. Uh, live to a group of teachers like this and posting it on YouTube after the fact. That's sort of the catch. Some people might not like that, but if you have anyone that's interested, please reach out to us and let us know so that we can book that and get it going. Uh, in the absence of any questions here, 
uh, or does anyone want to come on live and ask a question? That's the other option. I can always take you, you know, get you to unmute your microphone and promote you here, and you can come on and ask your question live if you want. I'm totally open to that. Seeing a lot of people just taking in the information today, but not a lot of questions today, which is fine. So I think with that said, we'll stop here for now. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join me in watching this. And for those of you watching this after the fact, uh, let us know what you want to see in the future in terms of these webinars. We've got a lot of exciting material coming up on Fridays at noon here, noon Eastern. And thanks for your comments in the chat box, everyone. It's nice to spend my Fridays as always with you in doing this. And we will see you next Friday. Keep watching your inbox. I'm going to try and hit you every week for a little while here as we have a lot coming up with the registration links so that we can have our live audience. And uh, anytime, of course, if you don't register, just feel free to check out the YouTube channel and you'll see the live stream there. So have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you next Friday.